Good. Welcome, uh, dear colleagues, and uh, I think uh, we will be, uh, we are now ready to start, so uh, uh, let me wish you good morning, afternoon or evening, wherever you are joining us from, because we have all the continents with us today, and thank you for joining today's event when we are launching the compilation of good practices on engagement with uh, human rights uh, systems in the context of displacement and statelessness. So some of you may know that UNHCR has issued actually previously two compilations of good practices on engagement with human rights mechanisms at the time, but those were internal back in 2014 and 19. So we were not able to share them with partners and exchange and have uh, um, this kind of uh, open uh, dialogue and discussions about the, how to use more strategically uh, the human rights systems in our interventions, protection and advocacy work in the context of displacement and statelessness. So this time, this compilation is collecting over 40 good practices from different contexts, different situations, and including examples also from protection cluster settings, which may be of interest to some of you and the context in which you work. We really hope that this will be an inspiration for you and for colleagues to uh, to try to use more uh, strategically or more regularly the human rights mechanisms and systems more broadly. But let us hear from colleagues also how they have used it. And um, um, as you know very well um, already how our events work, uh, we will have about one hour and a half together. Uh, we encourage all of you to be active in the chat. Um, we will be constantly monitoring the questions, comments and uh, uh, ideas that you will be sharing. Um, so please do use it uh, actively, but keep your microphone on uh, mute so that we can have quality connection for everybody. So without any further delay, I would like to present you today's agenda and the panelists. So we are very fortunate and um, lucky because uh, we will hear the opening remarks from Julian Pricks, the UNHCR Assistant High Commissioner for Protection, about her uh, take on the use of human rights systems and uh, uh, strategic use of human rights mechanisms. Then Peter will very, very briefly um, present us the compilation so that everybody feels comfortable with the guide and knows uh, where to find relevant information and actually the variety of examples that is collected there. And we will then really go to our panel uh, discussion and hear very varied examples from colleagues how they have used this in practice in their work in the field, new NHCR, and I hope this will give you also some insight and bring it much closer in terms of what it means really in practice. Firstly, we will hear from Mamadou Yambali, who is the representative in Ethiopia. Thank you, Mamadou, for being with us. Um, followed by Bettina Gambert, working in Morocco, she is Senior Protection Officer, followed by Lisa Varshi from the Eastern Horn of Africa Bureau, and Patrice uh, Dosu Awansu from the West and uh, Central Africa Bureau. So, a big variety. Um, also, you will see that the examples they will share come from different angles, uh, use of different types of mechanisms so that we have a full picture of what it can represent for us. And we will then have a, an opportunity to exchange. So colleagues, get ready. If you have questions or any points or further examples you would like to share, we will have enough time to do so. And our event will be closed by Madeleine Garlick, who is the Chief of the Protection Police and Legal Advice Section in the Division of International Protection. So we have very interesting agenda ahead of us and not to take uh, more of the time, I would like to ask please, uh, Julian, if you could open our event. Over to you. 
Well, greetings, everybody. Um, and thank you, Valerie, uh, very much indeed. It's it's terrific to be with you because I think this is this is such an outstanding achievement uh, to get this information, these examples uh, into the public arena for the first time. So can I begin then by congratulating um, Valerie and all her team? But as she has, of course, pointed out, these examples come from the field. It comes from people who've actually done this uh, at the field level. And uh, so this is a, a whole of um, of uh, UNHCR effort uh, with very, very practical examples um, of the key question of how uh, one can use the human rights systems uh, to advance the fundamental principles of human rights law, but to do so in a way that advances refugee outcomes, which is, of course, what we want. So congratulations to you all. And, and can I recognize um, not only Valerie as the leader of the of the Human Rights Liaison Unit, but um, Madeline, of course, uh, for for from the Division of International Protection, Peter Svenyaski, I think he's going to to, uh, to host some of this. Um, and also, of course, uh, Mamadou, Bettina, Lisa, Patrice, uh, I will really be interested to see how you describe uh, how you how you did this and uh, and and what success and uh, you had and what lessons we all learned from from working within the system. Well, I'd like to make a few very very general comments and then I'll I'll pass I'll pass over to you. But uh, first, to make the very perhaps obvious point that the principles of international solidarity and humanity are all parts of international human rights law, um, and uh, critically. If we can respect human rights law, then I think we will see fewer people uprooted and and uh, compelled to live in displacement environments or where they completely lack um, citizenship, where they're stateless. Of course, a, a very, very major example of this is the situation of the Rohingya in Myanmar, where they have been denied birth certificates, denied nationality, absolutely fundamental principles of, 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 um, of uh, human rights law. Uh, and that has been, of course, a fundamental un principle, uh, basis on which we've seen um, acts amounting, of, uh, of course, to, to, to genocidal acts, but acts which have led to a million now seeking um, protection, uh, as they have done in Bangladesh. So I think we can really make the link between the lack of respect for human rights and human rights principles and and the level of displacement we're seeing globally. And I'm very firmly committed to the view that while the 20th century was one in which we developed all of these laws, including, of course, the Refugee Convention itself more than 70 years ago, uh, but the challenge for the 21st century is to implement them. And, in, and what this compilation does is to show how the system can be used, the human rights uh, system, uh, can be used to give practical implementation to the fundamental principles. And that's really what I find uh, so uh, extremely uh, exciting. Of course, you will all know very well that the fundamental human rights uh, law uh, strengthens the mandate that, that we have at the UN Refugee Agency, because the human rights uh, laws complement and go beyond the protection set out in the 1951 convention and the statelessness conventions. Um, I'm always amazed when I do go back and reread the 51 convention, just how revolutionary it was, how far-sighted it was, because it, not only was it, of course, the, the normative principles of, uh, of non-reformant and right of access to asylum, but it also talks about social and economic rights uh, that took many, many more years to, to be uh, implemented in terms of treaty obligations and, and still remains one of the areas uh, that we're, we're having struggling to give uh, realisation to um, uh, in, in, in contemporary times. So um, one example that I think I'm, I'm always very aware of is uh, in the context of refugee law is the importance of the right to family. Um, and the Convention on the Rights of the Child. They really do uh, give a, a depth and substance to the work that we do in refugee in refugee law. There are many, many mechanisms uh, that give effect to human rights law, and I, I know you're all very well informed about them. Uh, one that I've had um, quite a bit to do with uh, has been the Universal Periodic Review. And there will be many in the scholarly environment who will say these systems don't work, that they are they're talk fests, they are they're, they're highly formalised environments, that governments are less than forthcoming with the truth uh, and that it's extremely difficult to get any outcomes of, for example, the Universal Periodic Review. But one thing that I find particularly heartening about this compilation is that you demonstrate 
that using the mechanism of the Universal Periodic Review and the recommendations, you can actually use this as part of your advocacy and strategy to achieve outcomes on the ground. And, and one that I, I particularly wanted to mention just because I've just returned from, from there is Liberia. Um, of course, one has to understand the history of Liberia and I won't, uh, won't take up time. You're probably very well aware of it, but very unusual environment for Liberia. But it has in its, um, in its, in its laws um, made a number of uh, very restrictive um, uh, uh, laws in relation to acquiring nationality. Um, and uh, at the, uh, the, the 36th session of the UPR's working group, uh, UNHCR made a number of recommendations on the right to nationality and the right to free birth registration. And this uh, UPR recommendations ultimately was taken up by the Liberia, by our colleagues in Liberia, who then worked uh, to uh, gain agreement by the government that recommendations would be made to ensure that all former refugees and refugee children born in Liberia would be given birth certificates and uh, and a meeting uh, was then held to ensure that national identity registry uh, bodies would or then issue the ID cards to all persons of concern to UNHCR in that country. Now there's more work to be done. Uh, having just been there, I did raise the 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 constitutional provision uh, that only those of African descent can acquire uh, Liberian nationality at birth or through naturalization. Um, uh, the, the ministers that I spoke to uh, smiled, said it was extremely difficult. They understood our concerns and they'd work on it. So I'm not pretending we found a solution to that one. But what I am saying is that using the UPR process has proved to be effective, at least to make sure that the birth certificates are there. And that is the core problem um, uh, that we see through, through many, many parts of the world, but, but perhaps uh, recently, of course, in, in, in Africa. There are other examples um, that, that I can quote that are all in, in here. Um, uh, one is the uh, working with the special rapporteur on LGBTI Q, uh, that you, working with that those rapporteurs can be enormously effective. And with regard to um, sexual orientation issues, uh, that rapporteur helped us with a roundtable. Uh, the first I think we've held for over 10 years that led to many recommendations, 600 advocates and, um, uh, and victims uh, of, of discrimination came together and came up with a number of very, very positive recommendations, which are now forming our strategy in, a, as you will all know, an extremely difficult political environment, but forming the basis of our strategy for continuing to work on LGBTIQ work rights for uh, for refugees. And the last example I'd like to mention um, is again one I've had a little bit to do with myself, which is the, the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Um, uh, we have joined uh, the June 21 session of the Conference of the Parties. Uh, in, in the in the hope of um, contributing to a back, background paper to protect the rights of, of refugees with disabilities. And we know the numbers, particularly in armed conflict um, uh, and, and humanitarian emergencies are uh, very, very high numbers. And uh, I think that uh, that work through uh, the uh, conference of the parties for, uh, for the uh, Convention on, on People with Disabilities uh, is another area or way in which we can use the mechanisms under the UN uh, human rights law to achieve outcomes for for refugees with disabilities. And, and there are many, but I think somebody said there are 40 examples in this uh, in this collection. And I very much look forward to seeing this getting out into the public arena um, uh, to to really demonstrate uh, that these processes, which are a long way from perfect, um, and do not produce uh, immediate outcomes can be taken up by UN agencies and other bodies like the UNHCR uh, to achieve real impacts and outcomes on the ground. And I think uh, I congratulate all of you for the work that you've done. And I'm really delighted that, that Valerie and her team have, have had such good collaboration from the field because you're the ones, people in the field, who've been actually producing uh, uh, these outcomes and been had the vision uh, and the, uh, put the strategic time into working with the relevant um, human rights uh, 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 treaty system. So thank you all very much. Congratulations again. And I look forward to hearing uh, uh, more of the examples that, uh, that you'll provide in this session. Thank you so much, Gillian, for uh, sharing with us, uh, not only in the opening remarks, but also a lot of key messages, uh, actually, from your experience and linking it to your recent mission to Liberia and actually how you could make the link immediately with the UPR recommendation and see what the impact has been on the ground.
is extremely valuable to hear it from you, to hear uh, uh, how the lack of respect of the human rights impacts directly the situation of displaced and stateless persons and how those systems can support UNHCR protection and advocacy strategies is extremely uh, important and valuable. So thank you so much, Gillian, for setting the scene for our discussion today. And I would like to give the floor now to Peter to walk us uh, briefly through, uh, through the compilation, please. Over to you, Peter. Thank you, Valerie. I think you should all be seeing it on the screen now, and I'll also be putting it in the chat. I'll just be doing three things. I'll briefly present the tool. I'll help you get familiarized with the index and, and how you could use this tool in practice. Uh, and then I'll just highlight some related resources and provide links as well. So you can also take some of these practices and link them with other units, CR tools and resources and, and our external tools as well uh, to, to see how you can apply them best in your particular context. Uh, so you'll see, and it's been mentioned by colleagues as well, that there are a number of themes and different, uh, a wide range of examples included in this compilation. Uh, we've broken them into categories uh, of the type of engagement and the objectives. So this allows you to kind of see, are we looking to, in this case, you can see, uh, work on our advocacy or dialogue with the government. In that case, you may want to look through the different examples that are highlighted there, and you can see some of you know, a snapshot of what they're about. You can go down into the guide and look at them further. We also cover things beyond the traditional engagement with UN mechanisms like the Special Rapporteurs and UPR. So we also talk about things and we have examples of, of partnership building, uh, ways we've used these mechanisms or engagement around the mechanisms or with with human rights related partners to build, build stronger partnerships. Other things as well, working on UNHCR's planning activities, um, you can see that we have some examples there, as well as on capacity building, training and technical assistance. Uh, as also mentioned, there are a number of cluster uh, examples in here as well from protection clusters. So you'll see that marked as well in the guide where we've put protection cluster with the, the title. You'll know that, that relates to a, an IDP context where the protection cluster was leading the engagement there as well. So that's also a, a unique ad, advent to this, this particular compilation versus our, our prior ones. When you identify a practice that you think is relevant, you can also click directly from the index and you'll jump down to that practice further in the guide. So I encourage you to look through the different categories, look through the different examples, see what might be relevant for you and interesting for your context. We have everything from directly engaging with human rights treaty bodies to uh, respond to instances of reformant, all the way to partnering with universities like our, our, legal, our, our liaison office in Vienna partnered with uh, human rights master's program to find opportunities for uh, sponsoring uh, refugee and, and asylum seeking students in, in master's education programs. So a wide range of practices in there that you can look at, look through and, and see what might be relevant to your context. I would also then perhaps mention a, a couple of other tools that, that you might be able to use in combination uh, with this. And one is, this is an internal UNHCR start tool, but we've also developed a, a brief dashboard on how to you know, quickly identify where these examples are taking place and also to see by a particular mechanism what these uh, what these uh, mechanisms have done in the different uh, examples that we have. So if you'll allow me, I'll just share my screen and you'll see here. And I'll also again put the link in the chat for your use. We have an interactive dashboard. I'll just take a moment to load. Also put the chat link there as well. So for UNHCR staff, you can access this as well. Uh, unfortunately, it's internal because it includes, as Valerie mentioned, those previous compilation examples that were uh, confidential. But for colleagues in UNHCR, you can take a look at this dashboard and you can see here as well the global picture of where these practices are coming from. You can zoom in on them and see, you know, what what happened with a, the good practice in Canada or you can say, you know, what practices are there that relate to national human rights institutions and get a picture of of what that looks like across UNHCR's operations. So I wanted to flag that tool as well. It might be useful for you also in, in cross-referencing these examples with the guide. Uh, so we encourage you to take a look at that for UNHCR staff as well. Another tool that I'll, I'll also briefly mention is our Human Rights Engagement Toolkit. And if you've been in our other webinars, you've seen me mention this uh, many times, but UNHCR has developed a, a toolkit for human rights engagement, and uh, I put it in the chat as well. That's an internal one, but we've also developed 
a two pager, which is an external tool uh, for colleagues who want access to UNHCR's publicly available resources on human rights engagement. Uh, both, the both the dashboard and this compilation feature in the toolkit, so you can take a look at the toolkit as well and see you know, what other resources. Uh, once you identify a good practice example that may be interesting to you, you can go to the toolkit and see where can I find the resources that I need to engage that mechanism in, in my particular operation. So I wanted to just give that quick snapshot, but I, I will leave it there. I won't go into too much more detail. You can always message us at the Human Rights Liaison Unit if you have any questions about any of the practices or if you want to see how you can adapt some of them to your particular context uh, for use in your, your operation. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop there and uh, give the floor back to you, Valerie. Thank you so much, uh, Peter, for giving this uh, very good overview of the uh, compilation, but linking it also to the Human Rights Toolkit and the dashboard, which is available, which really can help you to filter by themes, by region, by topic, by country operation to get more ideas and inspiration how to take it forward. But I think uh, with this, we can actually go to our uh, panel. And uh, as you know, we are start, uh, starting with Mamadou Yanbalde, uh, the representative in Ethiopia, who is a very strong human rights champion. Some of you who, uh, amongst you who did the human rights engagement and practice learning program know that we have also videos recorded by Mamadou and uh, different initiatives, uh, how he champions uh, the human rights engagement across UNHCR work. But Mamadou, please over to you to share uh, with participants your experiences. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Valerie, and uh, uh, for the kind words, but uh, also for, for, for this opportunity. I, um, uh, colleagues, friends, I, it is really a great pleasure for me to, to, to join the Assistant High Commissioner for Protection and all of you uh, for the launch of this uh, compilation of good practices on engagement for human rights systems. Um, really join uh, Gillian in thanking um, the colleagues for organizing this, but also uh, for all those who contributed to developing this rich compilation of experiences from across different contexts. And um, it is inspiring to read um, um, our colleagues and uh, to see how they have advocated, engage with government and build partnerships to advance human rights and uh, how they have raised awareness on human rights issues and integrated human rights mechanism in protection activities. Um, um, to be very clear, this is a critical document I think for our protection and solutions work. Um, I wish we had many more of this compilation of good practices. I am sharing with you my bias here uh, towards um, 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 rich experiences that really form, I would say, the, the, the foundations of what we do. Um, and sharing these good experiences, you just heard Gillian, and I'm sure we'll be hearing more colleagues. Um, these are the ones that inspire and um, and um, and um, and make our work um, really rich and uh, and uh, and meaningful and and practical for again protection and, and solutions. Um, earlier this year, I took uh, part in a workshop. Um, um, aiming at bringing together actors to articulate a system-wide vision for the UN's approach to protecting um, human rights in all facets of its work, uh, including through developing a UN common agenda. Um, um, it was emphasized that while that agenda will draw an aspect of international human rights law and refugee law, the international human rights regime is its key foundation with a people-centered and rights-based approach to protection. Um, I know that we have not been saying it sufficiently well, but building strong partnership around human rights is also an essential tool to realize the global compact on refugees. As you know, that has not only some of the solid foundations of the 1951 Refugee Convention, but also um, the ones relating to all aspects of socioeconomic rights that we are all trying to, 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 to really make a reality, including through the realization of the first Global Refugee Forum, the pledges that were made by several actors, not only on 
um, again on civil and, uh, and other rights, but also on social economic rights, including uh, water, um, access to education, and few additional ones. What I think we, 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 we need as part of a group like this to further emphasize is that human rights are not foreign to us or to our persons of concern. Um, um, the right to flee persecution, war, conflict, the right to ensure access to territory, and it has again been underemphasized, the right to live with dignity. These are not things that are foreign to us. Um, the right to access employment and to have access to, um, 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 to freedom of movement, all of them contribute to the quality of our protection and solutions responsibilities. Um, I also know that this is very often easier said than done. Um, that's why I think most of us who have worked in the field know how challenging it is uh, on how best to advocate effectively with government, despite the generosity that they often um, are provided to people of concerns, but this is difficult. Um, I think a critical element, as much as the compilation is important, I think is to also determine what is the right um, human rights mechanism to use. Um, I think um, um, whether you are a protection officer, a head of office, a protection cluster lead, uh, or a representative like me in my new functions, um, uh, to advance the enjoyment of human rights means also uh, finding the right human rights mechanism. And this is what I have witnessed. In my last three field locations, um, um, in addition to Ethiopia, in Chad, in Liberia, and the Republic of Korea, we would spend as much time um, to determine the right human rights mechanism than to really determine how to advance it. So I think that is a critical aspect. Um, um, I wish we could also spend a bit more time on. In all the situations, what I have learned is that um, 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 if you are able to find that right mechanism, find the right partners, you will be able to make a real difference and advance it. Perhaps just trying um, um, to emphasize here uh, the work um, that we are trying to do in a context like Ethiopia. This is not a past history. This is um, history in the making. Um, I will not dwell too much into the details, but for UNHCR in a situation that is um, characterized by, 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 by violations of human rights um, uh, as a protection and solutions lead agency or a cluster lead agency for internally displaced persons, ourselves or as part of the UN country team, I want to say that uh, finding the right mechanism is critical. I also want to say that um, um, partnering with the, the right institutions is critical. Um, in a context like this, um, we would not uh, necessarily resort directly to the international human rights mechanism. We have, uh, we have been fortunate enough, and I have been providing briefings to, to Gillian and to our senior leadership, to our regional bureau director, that we have been fortunate to have a strong national human rights institution. So, and uh, that strong national human rights institution has also been able to build very strong partnership with the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights that have led to joint investigations um, that were um, um, jointly issued on 3rd of November. 2021. They found uh, human rights violations um, um, that, um, um, you know, um, affecting uh, persons of concern, the refugees, the IDPs, but also the general public. Uh, but they also uh, found um, some recommendations or made some recommendations pertaining to us and most importantly to the key actors, the government of Ethiopia, um, um, the regional authorities, uh, some of the, uh, the sub-national authorities, as well as to the government of Eritrea. But uh, something that is not much known, and uh, as I said again, I will not be saying too much here on this platform uh, because we are still um, uh, trading this carefully, is that we contributed. We contributed as UNHCR on logistics matters, on things relating to advice, 
pre, during, and uh, sharing our perspectives. And now there is an inter-ministerial committee that has been established at the Ethiopian level with uh, greater ramifications also to some of the processes that are happening at at the international level, including through the Human Rights Council. So I just wanted to, to, to share uh, perhaps um, as I end three, three key elements. One, it is that human rights mechanisms are not foreign to our protection and solutions work. Two, finding the right um, human rights mechanism is extremely, extremely important and will determine how we can improve the quality of our protection and solutions work. And three, um, in complex situations like the one we are dealing with today, um, 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 I think um, um, finding the right way between the, the national, the regional, as well as the global one is going to be extremely critical. So I end up here and thank you again for, for the excellent um, uh, document. This should inspire all of us and uh, I am certain that we will keep working around it. Thank you very much, Valerie and colleagues. Thank you uh, so much, Mamadou, for this uh, very concrete way how even in a very complex situation and operation, you are managing to find entry points and the added value of engaging with some less traditional partners, maybe for UNHCR, or how to, you mentioned, how to tailor specific use of mechanisms to uh, distinct contexts. So this is very key. And I really take away your point that we should spend as much time um, throughout the planning process, choosing wisely uh, the mechanisms we engage with as much as we engage with them thereafter and follow up. So uh, very important key messages. And uh, we know that you have been engaged with the mechanisms throughout your assignment. So you have very holistic view, uh, but also you see the added value it has brought to UNHCR operations. So thank you so much, Mamadou, uh, for sharing this with colleagues and being with us. And I would like to now move to our next panelist, uh, to Bettina Gambert, uh, who will give us a concrete example from Morocco operation and the use of special procedures and treaty bodies. So thank you very much. And Bettina, over to you. Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Valérie and, and, and Peter, and uh, thank you for your continuous support. I am very pleased uh, to present uh, some uh, good practice uh, on Morocco operation. Uh, the Assistant High Commissioner, I'm very pleased uh, to participate in this panel, um, and dear colleagues. Um, so, just uh, an overview uh, of the collaboration. Uh, next, please, Peter. Um, of UNHCR Morocco operation with uh, different uh, human rights mechanisms. So in, in Morocco, we are collaborating with uh, the National Institution on Human Rights, uh, but also contributing to the for the UPR, for the special procedure and for the treaty bodies. For the With the National Institution on Human Rights, we are conducting joint advocacy. Uh, for example, joint advocacy for the adoption of a national uh, legislation on asylum, uh, but also we are organizing joint training and joint aw awareness session on uh, various uh, human rights and protection issues. We are also uh, conducting some uh, monitoring protection situation and uh, referring some uh, individual complaints. For the UPR, uh, we are contributing for the, for the reports to the OHCHR and also contribu contributing to the UNCT report. Regarding the, the special procedure, uh, we are meeting with a special reporter during their visit, but also providing comment and contribution on specific reports. And for the treaty bodies, uh, we are providing some confidential comments on the state's compliance and also on the movement on individual com complaints. Uh, now we'll present some uh, specific good practice. So next slide, please. Uh, the first one, I will present two good practices. Uh, the first one is the, the contribution to the preparation of the visit of the special rapporteur on contemporary, contemporary forms of racism. Uh, 
uh, just uh, uh, which took place in in 2018. Uh, just a brief overview of the of the um, of the context in Morocco. Uh, Morocco is a mixed migration context, uh, so it's a, a country of uh, of destination, a country of transit, and a, a country of departure. Uh, so they, there are lots of uh, of uh, uh, it's mixed with uh, with. Uh, migrants and uh, and groups and of course uh, uh, persons individuals with international protection protection needs uh, located at the at border with uh, with the spanish uh, <laughs> sorry uh, at the spanish enclaves uh, so at the, at that period in 2018 there were some uh, some uh, increased arrests uh, targeting mainly individuals of uh, sub-saharan origins uh, to prevent secondary movement to, to Spain uh, with uh, a lot of uh, detention and forced displacement to the southern localities. So in this context, uh, UNHCR provides uh, a note of information for the, for the special reporter uh, on the problem faced by the persons of concerns. Uh, but also uh, we were preparing and organizing the meeting with the partners, with the civil society, uh, with association of migrants and persons of consent. Uh, so based on the, during the visit, there were a lot of, uh, uh, the special reporter took a lot of, of testimonies and based on this testimony, that was the base for the, for the main recommendation. And the outcome and the main, next slide please, uh, so the, the main outcome of the of the of this report and this collaboration was uh, that better recognition of UNHCR documentation as a protection document and a decrease of uh, arrest and detention of asylum seekers and refugees. So all those holding and possessing UNHCR documentation uh, were were released and at risk uh, not at risk to be. Uh, 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 return to the home country and uh, uh, released from detention. So this is the, the first example. Now the, the second example uh, is, is uh, preventing extradition of asylum seekers, uh, collaborating with the, the Committee Against Torture. Uh, it was, uh, we, we, have, uh, we have intervened in uh, several cases uh, where asylum seekers were arrested by the government of Morocco on the basis of an extradition request. Uh, the extradition, after the extradition were authorized uh, by the Supreme Court, UNHCR has collaborated with the representative of the asylum seekers to uh, field an individual complaint to the CAT. Uh, UNHCR has provided information and uh, and all support on the risk of torture in case of extradition, and the CAT has agreed uh, with the individual complaint and set a request to interim measure while assessing the case. And in all the cases, this has led to safeguard the principle of non refoulement Next slide, please. Uh, so the, the principle was saved, the, all the asylum seekers were not uh, extradited to the, to, the, to, the, to the country and in some cases uh, uh, they, were, or they were released and, uh, and, uh, and, and now free. So this is, this is the, the, the two examples uh, for, for Morocco. Um, of course, they are still, uh, we will still uh, continue to, to be engaged. Uh, I have noticed like uh, the, the engagement, UNHCR engagement uh, with human rights mechanism is uh, is increasing, and uh, and uh, I thank you again uh, uh, the the all human rights units for the support and guidance. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bettina. And I must say what I really admire in uh, the approach that Morocco Cooperation takes is the very much holistic approach. You use the different human rights mechanisms for specific situations, but also very much in a complementary way. So you, you really think it through, um, actually linked to Mamadou's intervention. Uh, you think very thoroughly, as I know, uh, in which situation to reach out to which mechanisms and use them very effectively. And the 
cases uh, that you mentioned, prevention of non refoulement have been very, uh, very effective. And uh, I believe uh, oftentimes colleagues say, oh, but we have cases of non uh, of refoulement and what can we do and say, well, um, try the human rights mechanisms also to support your efforts. So thank you so much for uh, for sharing this with us, Bettina. I'm sure there will be also questions from colleagues when we come to questions and answers. But now I would like to give the floor to Lisa. Uh, uh, Lisa who will share with us examples on use of human rights mechanisms in Liberia. It seems that Liberia is the country to uh, to look into this uh, today because we have mentioned it already twice. Um, but uh, Lisa, please, if you could share with us some insight. Thank you very much, uh, Valerie, and uh, uh, good afternoon to all of your colleagues. And, I'm sorry, uh, Lisa, so can you speak closer to the microphone, please, or louder? Yes, if you. Okay. Is it better? Much better. Thank you so much. Okay. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. um, so just to say thank you very much for, for inviting me to be part of this. Um, when Peter got in touch with me, I was like, I'm no longer in Liberia. And he says, well, you still worked on it, so you can still speak to it. And I'm very happy that um, the Assistant High Commissioner for, for Protection was in Liberia and can speak to some of the work that uh, we started over there. And I'm, I'm happy to know that um, the colleagues in Liberia are continuing with the work that uh, we started over there. Um, with Liberia, I think that the the situation, um, as as Julian was saying, it's a, it's a country that has come out of a, a 13 year war, and it's still, um, although the year the war was over many years ago, um, it's still a country that is uh, struggling very much with anything from documentation to. Uh, provision of laws or um, law reform, for, for instance. So UNHCR and other um, UN agencies uh, really work together um, as, as a one UN. And this is one area that I really saw the one UN mechanism really working very well. Um, there is a human rights working group of which UNHCR is part of. Uh, it is under the leadership of the resident coordinator, but it is chaired by the representative of the OHCHR. So uh, in terms of the universal periodic review, the OHCHR is very much involved and we, so we don't work in isolation. Uh, we meet as a human rights uh, working group and we all look at what are some of the of the situation? And then we found out that we really had some common areas. For instance, when it came to birth registration, as much as refugee births were not um, being systematically registered, we found out that also national births were not being registered. And it's not it was not just because the government didn't want to; they just didn't have enough. Um, resources to be able to do that. So together with UNICEF, how do we work together to ensure that this could uh, be something that um, we could work together on? So in terms of giving feedback on the on the UPR process, um, I think in Liberia we we gave uh, feedback on on birth registration, on statelessness, citizenship, nationality, and as Julian uh, rightly said. There's this controversial provision on on um, uh, people who don't have Negro, um, should I say black blood uh, or African or, or not of African descent becoming citizens of, of Liberia. So this is something that we will we have consistently raised and I think we have to continue to consistently raise because it was the same thing with birth registration or uh, women not being able to give citizenship to, to their children, which is in their law. But in 2006, that um, 2016, sorry, that was uh, that was changed uh, in, in the Constitution. So at least for now, Liberian women are able to give citizenship 
to their children. It is just it it now has to be reduced into the national law from the constitution. So at least we are getting somewhere uh, with with that. Um, the human rights group has clear terms of reference, and uh, if this is something that other other countries can do, it's 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 a very clear um, process where all the UN agencies are then able to really see where they can fit in and where they can uh, support. And I would say that once the recommendations came back, and I remember Peter shared that with us, the, um, the human rights group met, we created a matrix, and then we said, we're going to create an action plan from this. So from 2021 to 2025, there's an action plan that has been created looking at all the recommendations and putting monetary value to it as well. So we have, uh, and I can share it with you after after this, because it's quite uh, progressive to see which UN agencies will work on which of the recommendations together with the government. So it's not the UN agencies doing it by themselves, but also identifying um, government ministries and institutions that we can work with. So for instance, the Ministry of Health um, takes care of birth registration. So UNICEF and UNHCR would work with the Ministry of Health to, to make sure that, and we, we actually put resources there. So it also helps us to make sure that we put that in our plan for the year. So on a yearly basis, we say that maybe for statelessness advocacy, we're going to put $10,000 and it, we have to make sure that it is in our budget as well as UNHCR. So those are some of the um, concrete steps that we took within um, within the organization to make sure that we're able to to advance this. So I, I would say that uh, for me that the, the, the lesson or should I say the lessons learned was number one, having strong leadership, having speaking with one voice, having strong leadership, uh, having an RC, a resident coordinator that is uh, able to mobilize the the UN city and able to advocate with the the donor community because they are all they also play a very vital role in making sure that they push the government with the and or even sometimes given conditions that we will only provide funding for this uh, situation if you you follow through on the recommendations that you accepted at the UPR. So these were these were working together with different um, the donor community, uh, with the UNCT, with the UN agencies, and of course the ministries and agencies, uh, the government ministries and agencies was, uh, and of course civil society as well, was very, very important. Liberia has a very, very rich civil society um, and NGO organization because of the the breakdown in law and order there were there was a there's a lot of civil society organizations that also work with uh the un agencies and the government to ensure that uh these um provisions are are, are pushed forward so um I, I will end here if there are any questions i will take it but i would say that lesson learned is having strong un city uh making sure that these human rights uh, working groups uh, we are part of it as, as UNHCR and be able to push our agenda uh, using multiple uh, agencies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. And I think this came uh, very strongly uh, the importance also to work in synergies with other entities to see what is uh, our complementarity and how we can reinforce each other. And what I found particularly interesting is also what you developed the action plan. Uh, once the UPR recommendations came back to Li uh, Liberia, how you put it or translated it into very concrete manner into five years action plan who does what in which manner what are the accountabilities and as you said also link it to resources as necessary so thank you so much lisa uh, for sharing that uh, with us it's a uh, very valuable um, 
Excellent. So I would propose we go to our uh, last example, but definitely not the least, uh, to be presented by Patrice uh, in the very strategic way how uh, the Western and Central Africa Bureau is approaching the human rights engagement. So Patrice, please over to you. Yeah, thank, no, thank you. Can, can you hear me? Not very clearly. Can you try again, please? Can you hear me now? OK, yes, it's better. Yeah, yes, OK. Better. No, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Valerie and your team for, for the leadership that you, uh, you you have demonstrated, you know, in, in putting all these uh, good practices together. And in particular, thanks to to also my colleagues from West and Central Africa who has uh, I mean, who are in the call and uh, have contributed to this uh, to this compilation. Uh, I think I will focus on three, three key uh, good practices. Uh, one of them uh, relates to the point raised by by Mamadou when he was talking about knowing knowing you know better the the human rights uh, uh, mechanism, uh, and based on that you can also articulate how to engage with them. For us, all started from from you know from that aspect, because without if you don't have a better knowledge of your context and link your context with the relevance of the of the human rights mechanism, it might be very difficult to get a protection dividend from that interaction. So we, we started uh, uh, saying, OK, we need a human rights uh, uh, engagement strategy, you know, based on what has been developed at a global level. And we, we decided to first of all do a survey to understand what is the state of, of collaboration with First of all, human rights uh, uh, institution in our region and the, and the mechanism uh, as a whole. And uh, we were shocked to understand that there is a lot that has been doing, you know, that we have been doing in the past uh, and previous colleagues who are in the region have been doing when it comes to engagement, which have not really been, you know, put together as, as good practices. Uh, and uh, beyond the the quantitative data that we got uh, based on, you know, MOU we have the with Human Rights uh, Commission at various level in in the countries. Uh, you will agree with me that when it's come to the thematic uh, mandate, uh, we have 45 of them globally, and we cannot engage with all the 45. You know, we need to do a kind of analysis to see the relevance. So we we did this kind of analysis. Beyond the survey, we did an analysis to understand what is the relevance, you know, of the 45 uh, 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 thematic mandate, you know, in West and Central Africa, and we came up with uh, two key uh, uh, output from that exercise. One of them is that, uh, as you know, we have two country mandates, uh, Ka and Mali, in our, in our region, and uh, we, we we finally agree uh, on 14 uh, uh, thematic mandate in our region. 14 based on the protection challenges we have, based on the context, and also based on the protection dividend that we want to get you know, from this, uh, from this uh, thematic mandate. And one of the consequent actions that we, we, we took, uh, uh, this is now the second point, is about uh, uh, the special uh, uh, rapporteur on con contemporary forms of slavery, uh, uh, namely in Mali. And for those who know in Mali very well, you, you know that we have a phenomenon uh, called uh, Decent day slavery. Decent day slavery uh, for those is a situation where slave status is ascribed to some people because their ancestors, you know, were allegedly uh, enslaved by the families, by the so called masters. So, and people who are born into slavery uh, work for these masters or, uh, without being paid or without, or sometimes are deprived from their basic human rights. And, uh, and from dignity, uh, and this has a, a, a tendency to provoke a displacement first, and also a tendency to put the people in a situation where they don't really enjoy the basic human rights. Uh, uh, so uh, thanks to the to the leadership from the uh, Human Rights Liaison Unit, we we took part in a in a webinar in August last year, 2021, uh, uh, where Mali colleagues present you know the situation of the decent based slavery in Mali, how is it affecting uh, human rights and how is it also provoking displacement within Mali? Uh, consequently, 
we 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 had a discussion, a separate, a focused discussion with the special rapporteur on on decent day slavery, on uh, uh, some contemporary form of slavery. Uh, the special rapporteur also on uh, uh, right of IDPs and the independent aspects uh, on human rights and situation in Mali to discuss concrete ways to address uh, 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 in Mali uh, this situation and throughout the Sahel. Uh, not just Mali, but now to the Sahel. So following following this discussion, uh, UNHCR provided you know trainings to to protection monitors because one of the key uh, 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 challenge is how to get actually data when it's come to the to the listen base. So uh, training has been provided to better equip the protection monitors in order to to collect you know a data that can be used in the advocacy uh, and also. Uh, for those who have read uh, recently the uh, the UN uh, position on, on return to, to Mali, we have also included an aspect on the different day slavery to see how we link it with the with the with the refugee state refugee state determination process. So these are two key uh, dividends that we got from from this action, uh, and we do hope that. Uh, uh, the, the remaining items that are being discussed also with the various uh, 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 mechanisms, namely, how do we push for a for a policy from the state uh, uh, that can address the decent based slavery and its consequences, and how do we push also for for a law criminalizing the decent based slavery in Mali? These are two outcomes that we do expect that with the engagement with the uh, special rapporteur, we will come to the to the to the good conclusions. A, a third point, uh, which is also important to court, is uh, you know we are in a region where the regional economic communities are, are very active. Uh, I'm talking about the ECOWAS uh, Economic Community for West African States, where we have a court of justice. Uh, UNHCR working closely with the court of justice to a partnership that we 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 have uh, signed in, in 2015. But it's important to say that. Uh, uh, this partnership has been in a kind of hibernation for the last couple of years. Uh, 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 so we have not really been able to, to engage them when it's come to uh, supporting the court to implement its mandate as a community court, as a human rights court, as a, as, a, as a tribunal, also as an administrative tribunal, and also as an arbitration tribunal. So we, we, we decided last year to organize a, a, a a retreat with the uh, with the court, with the ECOWAS Court of Justice. The idea is actually to revitalize our, our partnership and see how uh, refugees, IDPs, uh, people at risk of statelessness or stateless, you know, can can mutually benefit from the from the mandate and the competence of this court. Uh, what we we came up with is uh, is an action plan, you know, can, that can be centered around, uh, let's say, four points. The first point is design and implement the capacity development of judges and lawyers on relevant laws and policies when it comes to refugee law and also international humanitarian law. Uh, second one is ensuring knowledge of the public uh, on the court mandate, on the court function, and also how do we promote access to the court. Uh, and finally, how do we act as an intervener in the court uh, when it comes to amicus curia? And finally, build a, a jurisprudence on, on refugee law. A, a, a consequent uh, or a subsequent uh, uh, dividend that we already got from this uh, less than a year uh, with the ECOWAS Court of Justice is that uh, we are now working on a on a joint publication, UNHCR and the ECOWAS Court of Justice, to 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 uh, you know share experience on the mandate of the court, the processes, and the procedure also before the court. So that it can be better known to the to the party. So these are just few, you know, good practices that uh, I, I can share. But we have many, many other instances, as you can see. West Africa is very well represented in the in the compilation of good practices. And uh, thank you once again, colleagues, and and Valerie for your leadership. Thank you. Over to you. 
Thank you so much, Patrice. It's uh, so inspiring uh, always to listen to you, to see how um, the region is taking it very strategically, in my opinion, you know, starting from survey, actually getting an overview, what are the practices, but how we can also take it forward and then prioritize your approach of looking, OK, so we have some main priority protection issues and linking it back to Mamadou's point, thinking through which mandates we will engage with, what are the priority themes that we will take forward. So this is uh, very important and you gave a concrete example with the special rapporteur on slavery and what it has led to and how you take it even farther beyond, of course, the reports, statements, country visits and much more. Um, the example you gave on uh, collaboration with the Court of Justice of ECOVAS, it shows uh, to the importance of diversifying, I believe, our partnerships on the human rights front. And uh, there are many aspects in this collaboration. But again, um, as mentioned at the beginning, the importance of synergies with other actors and uh, um, doing a mapping of who can be the strategic interlocutors is really key. So thank you so much, uh, Patrice, for sharing uh, those points and uh, experiences with us. I'm sure that it was also uh, useful and inspiring for colleagues. And I would like to ask um, colleagues to don't be shy to uh, to put your questions in the chat so that we can take advantage of um, the wealth of knowledge of our panelists to uh, to go a bit deeper or to share exchange around some examples. But before doing so, I know also that Maria Vences from the Regional Bureau of Americas would like to say a few words about the experiences of uh, Americas. So uh, Maria Vences, oh, over to you. Thank <clears throat> Good morning, colleagues. Good morning, uh, Assistant High Commissioner, Valerie, of course, Madeline, Peter, and I saw also Mamadou and also all uh, good friends from before uh, around the call. So thank you very much for giving us this opportunity. I will not be too long, but yes, we wanted just to um, to really make a few reflections on the Americas. As you know, I mean, we have a very unique system in which we have the Inter-American Court of Human Rights and also the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, all that together with a heavily politicized environment. As you know, now we have every day at different elections and different shift of uh, uh, asylum and migration policies. So having the, the tools, the strong tools of human rights is really important for UNICEF when it comes to advocate for the rights of persons of concern and particularly in the issue when it comes to human mobility, uh, pushbacks, etc. So I think that we have actually used a lot the special rapporteur mechanisms particularly in the migrant uh, rapporteur, the issue of pushbacks, also the um, uh, violence against women, the one on the disability, and as well the CEDO. We also have been contributed last year or the year before on the regional um, on our regional uh, consultations for the general commentary on trafficking of women and girls in the context of migration. Just to say for us, it's a key opportunity to use the universal periodical review and also the special rapporteurs because they help us to the advocacy when we cannot really speak. Sometimes, for instance, in the Caribbean, it's extremely sensitive to talk about human rights issues. So we use these mechanisms to advocate and to reach out and be the voice of UNICEF whenever we are not able to do so or is not appropriate for us. So only to say on the um, important also the dissemination of the tools that UNICEF has actually developed. This tool is going to be very important. We have also um, ongoing translations on the tools and also very much the notes that you have actually shared with us on the Convention of the Right of the Child, the Convention on the Disabilities and Economic and Social Rights is extremely important for us. Um, we would also be able to have been distributed to the field and it's important that we also be aware of what is the use of these uh, of these tools. Uh, also important perhaps to see what is the intersection with other actors when it comes to human rights advocates. For instance, as we mentioned civil society, for us the issue of uh, other courts, local courts is also important and, uh, and human rights advocates at the national level. 
Um, in terms of the global issues, and then I go to which we, we collaborate, I mean, it's important perhaps what Mamadou have said in terms of the global compact on migra um, global compact on refugees, sorry, and also the follow up of the human uh, high level official meeting. For us, it's also important that at this moment, when we do the planning 2023 strategic planning, this is also embedded on the protection and solution strategies of the country operations. We have provided from UNICEF uh, in the Bureau a number of guidelines. For, uh, for the um, operations, how to incorporate the different thematic uh, issues into the planning or strategic plan in 2023. I think that collaboration with the Human Rights Institution should be one of those in which shapes the protection and solution strategies. Um, and also how we can follow up on the, on the high level official meeting. I think it's very important. On the um, on the what we do, we actually collaborate a lot with the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. I mean, it's a key ally for many years, not only because it's a human rights uh, instrument at the regional level, but also because it has progressively developed international refugee law beyond the Convention of the 1951. So we also have the Cartagena Declaration, but also in terms of asylum and statelessness, migration rights, when it comes to um, rights of persons of course in the migration context, for instance, the children, access to asylum and statelessness has been more progressive when it comes to the standard setting that Inter-American Court of Human Rights had actually developed. So it complements very much the, the 1951 convention. Also, when it comes to protection of persons of consent, which are not the typical ones, just to say, for instance, the indigenous is an issue that we're very much using at the moment, the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights to advocate for them. IDPs, I mean, it's not been fully mentioned, but I think it's important for us, also very political sensitive. For instance, Guatemala, we don't, uh, the government does not recognize the situation of IDPs. So IDPs, statelessness, indigenous at the moment is very important for us that we use these mechanisms. With the Inter-American uh, uh, Commission of Human Rights, we have a partnership agreement and we use them for advocacy, for development of uh, also standards and recommendations to states. Most lately, we have actually uh, developed together with them a guidance on family reunification and another one on access to asylum and asylum procedures, which is very interesting in the context, as I said, when it comes to mixed movements and onwards movement. So we actually have that collaboration, which is which is ongoing. And the last one that I wanted to mention is also we have a lot of collaboration with the Ombudsman at the national level and also the um, legal defenders or public defenders. It's a unique figure within the Americas. And we have a regional uh, round table is going to be scheduled for the second half of the year with the Ombudsman and the legal defenders. So this is this is where we are at the moment. And I think there's so many other things, but I think these are the highlights that we wanted to to highlight. And as I said, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity and also for learning as well from other regions and what are they doing. So and also for the tools that you have developed for us is key uh, in advocating and also to be distributed to the other actors um, that UNICEF collaborates or have partnership with. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Maria Mences, for complementing the picture uh, with the perspective of uh, Americas. Uh, so uh, there is a lot, of course, uh, that uh, uh, you have all, um, experience and very specific ecosystem of human rights in in the region. So this is uh, excellent. So. Colleagues, if you allow me, I would like to go uh, to the questions and answers and we will go back to the panelists. I see we have a question uh, in the chat from Goretti. Um, she would like to uh, add that um, um, the importance on uh, strengthening the work on collaboration with national human rights institutions, um, also how they can contribute to the monitoring initiatives and the importance of supporting it. So also what Mamandu mentioned, I think the strategic collaboration with national human rights institutions and what Patrice shared from and the um, region of Western and South Central Africa. This is very important. Thank you, Goretti, for bringing it uh, uh, to the chat as well. Uh, Roberta, over to you for a question, please. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much for the very rich discussion. I have just a question, and I think I see in the chat that also uh, Leonor has the same question. I want to know more uh, about the uh, civil society involvement in these processes, to what extent civil society actors were involved 
and uh, and the advantages of involve of uh, involving those actors in, uh, in in strengthening the protections of human rights. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Roberta, for this question and on uh, how the dialogue with the civil society has contributed uh, to those efforts. Um, that's excellent. I see Tobias, so over to you for a question, please, Tobias, and then Max. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Valerie, and the colleagues, uh, the panelists, uh, Patrice and uh, Bettina and the rest of the colleagues. I think this has been very informative and uh, I you have demonstrated to us the best the best part of it i am very much interested also to see you know what 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 could what could the situation look like in the in the worst uh, worst practice i mean if if you have ever encountered you know any, any worst practice and what are, what could we learn from uh, from this because you know what you are presented are all good and sometimes situation does not in the field doesn't doesn't look like that and uh, it's good to go back and, and look at uh, how best can we prepare for the worst in case we encounter and I think that is where we are always dealing with our lives in the field in everything so I would, I would really from the penalties if one can give a worst case uh, I mean a worst scenario and what's best practice and how best can we learn from and prepare maybe you know in the future thank you so much very uh, i mean i'm just very abstract there but of course we know that we have encountered a lot of worse uh, encounters with, with difficult governments so that is where i am coming from thank you Thank you so much, Tobias. And maybe this question also on lessons learned is really interesting. Uh, Max, over to you. Thank you. Hello, colleagues. Greetings from Mexico. It's always great to be part of these inspiring sessions. Um, my question um, is very practical. Uh, how can we in the field support in the dissemination of this tool? Is there any maybe global event plans that we can link up or um, or any other ways that you uh, recommend that uh, this external document is uh, brought to the attention of uh, practitioners. Thank you. Thanks and congrats again. Thank you so much, uh, Max. A uh, very important question as well. So maybe I would like to go back to panelists with this first set of questions and uh, then we go back over to you. Uh, Bettina, maybe if you would like to start, if there are any elements to take, Lisa, Patrice. Um, uh, just to give an example, two examples regarding the, the collaboration and the, the, the relation with uh, with uh, National Institute on Human Rights and uh, also to, to the civil society. Uh, uh, um, still uh, give, giving example in uh, in Morocco. Uh, in Morocco, there, there is so the, the National uh, Institution on Human Rights, and they have some regional commission on human rights. Uh, so they have uh, they have established a kind of uh, a protection monitoring mechanism in the in the whole country, and especially in uh, in uh, in uh, in Western Sahara. Uh, where unfortunately uh, UNHCR does not have access, and uh, where they, there is a, 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 some some uh, some violation and uh, uh, um, a protection situation quite uh, 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 <laughs> uh, that we, we do not have a lot of information, and they, they are the one who are providing the information together with the, the civil society. So the work we are doing with uh, with uh, with the, the national institution is mostly to yes to gather information to to have some regular meeting uh, online or, 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 or presential uh, with uh, the the regional commission on human rights. So we are targeting, of course, the localities where the asylum seekers and uh, refugees are located because in Morocco they are located in more than 70 different localities so it's very difficult for UNHCR to have to monitor all the, the protection situation in the, in, the, in the whole country. So we have uh, the, this mechanism but also uh, the, the, the here in Morocco the, the 
the, the, the National Institution on Human Rights is also uh, has the lead for African national institution uh, of, from other countries. And uh, th there are some annual meeting with other representative or of other African representative of other African countries. Uh, and this is a, a great opportunity to, to have uh, some kind of, of, of course, so awareness session and sensitization and, and, and um, capacity development activities, but also to try to harmonize and to liaise and to, to strengthen the collaboration with this national institution uh, with UNHR in, in other countries. So that, that's one. And we, with the civil society, we have uh, in Morocco that uh, uh, um, association very, very engaged uh, in, uh, in, uh, in defending and in protection monitoring, uh, especially in specific localities at the border with Algeria or in localities close to the to the border with Spain, uh, and this is the the the. So we are closely working with the civil society. One uh, to to get, of course, uh, information to have like still some protection mechanism, uh, but also they are very very acting in uh, in releasing publicly uh, info information and uh, uh, for for to. Um, just to sensitize the, 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 the government and to denounce uh, uh, the, the violation and uh, publicly to inform uh, the, 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 the society. Uh, this is the two points I would like. I wanted to, to get back, but, but uh, <laughs> thank you. And Valérie, maybe you can, you can respond. What about the role of the civil society also? And that would be very interesting with the question on uh, uh, how now to, to de disseminate the, 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 the report. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Bettina. Uh, before we go to Patrice, I see also a question from Juliet about uh, what is actually the strategy to incorporate human rights uh, and work with human rights mechanisms into the protection and solutions agenda? And uh, are there some concrete action plans in terms of incorporating into our programming and implementation? So as we go to you, Patrice, I thought you may have some elements on this, so I brought it as well. If you can please address it over to you. No, thank you. No, thank you, Valeria. Thanks to the colleagues eh, for, for all these uh, observations, comments and questions. I, I think there are two, when it comes to work with civil society in the National Human Rights Commission, we, we, we have seen in, for instance, I will give you an example in Niger that we have seen now uh, uh, last year. Uh, I'm sure some of you are aware of the G5 Sahel forces. Uh, that is, that there was a situation where some some uh, forces, you know, from come from a specific country. Uh, I will not go into more detail here. Uh, were involved in the in, in some gender-based violence uh, in the region called Terra uh, 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 in Niger. Uh, what happened? It happens that the UNHCR protection monitors happen to be the first on the ground, you know, to collect data and also to have uh, uh, not only information about the survivors, but also information about the about the the the, the, the perpetrators, the presumed perpetrators. So, uh, what we have done because we 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 know that there is also an important aspect of. Uh, 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 legal uh, support uh, uh, to ensure that the cases are, are prosecuted. Uh, we have briefed, uh, you know, the, the National Human Rights Commission in Mali, in, in Niger, and also the civil society uh, in a, in a closed door discussion. Uh, the, the, and they were the one who came up with now a public, a, a public communicator, you know, talking about the violation and urging the parties uh, and the, 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 the specific countries where the militaries were coming from, actually to take action in terms of prosecution. So the, for us, this is a, a very important step, a, a, a concrete example that we, we can give you. And the, this comes again to confirm what uh, Bettina was saying is, how do we organize our protection briefing, you know, activities? And what are, who are the allies? Uh, 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 so this is important to know, who are the allies? And how can we count on them to say what we are not able to say in order to push the protection agenda? Uh, the same uh, another uh, example that I can share with you during the uh, COVID, let's say in the first in the in the second half of uh, 20, 2020, you know, uh, the National Human Rights Commission in the region 
where the first entity that came up clearly talked to this, advocating with the state, ensuring that refugees, IDPs, uh, and all that vulnerable uh, 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 persons are included in the safer plans to address to address COVID. Uh, and this was uh, a kind of uh, burden sharing between UNHCR and the National Human Rights Commission to at least come forward and say refugees, IDPs need to be included in, in anything that is being done. And beyond that, we have seen, for instance, in uh, in uh, uh, in Cameroon, in Mali, in Guinea, how they were very vocal to uh, you know public communicate, you know asking states to to to, to take action to include refugees in, in, in what 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 is undertaken. Uh, about the question of uh, Juliet, I, I, I will reflect upon one conversation that I had with her. I remember with Valerie uh, when we were, we, were, we were preparing the last year the human rights learning program. I think something that that speak more to me today, you know, after taking also stock of all the activities that the human rights liaison unit is doing and uh, all the good practice that are, that that are being shared, the dividend that we get from the UPR. Something that needs to be pushed is how do we talk more about centrality of human rights instead of talking about centrality of protection. Because to me, centrality of protection really doesn't translate what we want to say when it's come to enjoyment of civil, economic, civil rights, civil and political rights, and also the social economic rights. So this is how I, I, I see more things. And uh, I'm very glad to know that uh, the Assistant High Commissioner for Protection is here now that there is a discussion ongoing when it's come to the to the revision of the of the transformative agenda. This notion of centrality of protection is not really, I don't see it very concrete. What I see more concrete is centrality of human rights. And this gives us more room to ensure that all the rights you know, are included in our in our strategy when it's come to really share uh, protection. Yeah, uh, over to you, Marie, and thank you. Thank you so much, Patrice, for those insights uh, and responses to colleagues. Uh, Peter, would you like to share with us some few hints how this guide uh, and a compilation can be disseminated as well before we come to the concluding remarks? Sure, just very quickly. Thanks for that, Max. Of course, we would be happy to see it uh, disseminated well. Um, as we said, this is the first time it's been a public good practice compilation. Um, so we encourage you to to take examples from your region as a basis for reaching out to civil society, as we just discussed, uh, also national human rights institutions. Um, if you think that there's examples from your region that could serve as a basis for exploring those same things with those partners, please feel free to do, do so. Please feel free to reach out to us as well and see if we can brainstorm around that. Also, you're welcome to share this, you know, in any events or activities that you have ongoing, um, as well as the, the two pager of external tools. So. I'll put those both back in the chat as well. You can share this good practice compilation, but you can also share the external tools and and with those you can pull from those different elements that might be relevant for different events and uh, mainstream it through the different activities that you're doing. But again, if you want to talk about a, d a discrete project or, or a particular event, please feel free to reach out to us and we're, we're happy to support. So thanks for that, that comment. Thank you so much, Peter. And it's a bit late for colleagues in Asia Pacific region, but also to share that they are they are planning to organize a dedicated event in the region um, and to add it to the NGO consultations framework and to focus on uh, human rights engagement in Asia Pacific region. So it can also be an inspiration. But Madeline, I'm now turning to you, uh, uh, if possible, to bring this all rich <laughs> discussion together and take us forward uh, for the concluding remarks, please. Madeline. Thank you so much, Valerie. And really, let me first of all extend a very warm thanks and congratulations to all of the colleagues who've taken part today. I think we've heard invaluable insights about not only the potential, but in fact, the concrete actual impact that many of our human rights tools and our human rights based strategies are having on the ground. What we've really heard today is that human rights principles and UNHCR's commitment to them are not just words on paper. Rather, we have examples in this guide that highlight in over 40 different cases, the rich and varied ways in which colleagues 
have and are continuing to use human rights principles to support their protection work and objectives. It's really a testimony to the determination, to the expertise, but also to the innovation and the skill that our colleagues have brought to bear in many very challenging situations in which it may seem that the climate is difficult and uh, the receptivity low, but where they have worked together with partners to achieve really impressive results. I think it's noteworthy that we see good practice examples in this guide that span across a range of different categories of activity. We have clear uh, uh, positive examples of the way in which advocacy and awareness raising goals around the rights of all of our categories of persons of concern have been served through effective work with human rights partners. We've also seen uh, very importantly the way in which accountability for human rights violations and threats to human rights can also be brought home through work with courts as well as other adjudicative bodies. And this is extremely important because of course this can really lend seriousness and can uh, cause our interlocutors to see how crucial it is not only to listen to UNHCR's encouragement to be aware that there can be consequences that follow their failure to respect the rights of our persons of concern. We see also the way in which capacity development objectives have been surfed through human rights engagement related activities. And this I think is a really important and extremely uh, 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 productive aspect of our human rights work because it goes to show how we can really bring something positive to our partners at national level and through supporting capacity development also seek to ensure the sustainability of some of our work. It doesn't just need to rely upon you and HCR to take action to ensure that human rights standards can be respected, but we can help put in place the elements, the building blocks to enable others to take this work up. And then finally, uh, but certainly not least, the partnership aspect. We have on the line here today colleagues also from some of our key partner organisations, and of course the guide highlights just how rich and diverse the partnerships are. This element I think is really crucial because it does serve to highlight that we can achieve so much more working together and drawing on the respective strengths, the insights, the expertise and the mandates of many of those that we work with in national situations around the world. So I guess as we come to the end of this event, uh, the really big question is then indeed what next? And I think Juliet's question is a really important one for us, where she asks what indeed what the strategy is for incorporating human rights into our protections and solution strategies. And in many sense, colleagues, this really is up to all of us now. We need to think about the way in which we can at our national level in our work, in our own work plans, those of our teams and those of our operations. How can we build in these standards, use of these tools that we have at our disposal in order to achieve protection goals? The planning process is underway for many of us now as we look ahead to 2023 and 2024 and it's an opportunity to signal that there are ways in which we can work with human rights mechanisms in order to pursue some of our goals. One of the fortunate things is, I think I can say quite positively, this need not be work that requires large amounts of ops budget. This is things where things that we can undertake with our protection resources, with our own resources, our staff, our colleagues, ourselves, uh, but look at ways in which we can strategically use the tools that are there and the partnerships that are uh, either existing or are potentially there for us to develop in order to achieve protection goals. I think that uh, what we hope this guide can really do then is provide some inspiration. You can see that there are colleagues who have taken very different and creative approaches to using human rights mechanisms. I would encourage all of you to think about how you could adapt or draw upon some of these examples for uh, your own national or regional contexts. And please do feel free to reach out to us in headquarters in DIP at any time if you'd like to brainstorm about how best to do this or if there are particular forms of support, advice or tools that could help you to do that. We are there as a resource to help you in that regard. So really, once again, let me thank everyone who's taken part to our panelists for their time, thought and inspiring examples. Also to everybody who contributed to the compilation of the guide, to the partners with whom we work on an ongoing basis, to the Assistant High Commissioner for Protection for her inspiring and encouraging words. But let me also particularly thank Valerie and Peter and other colleagues in the human rights team, Kate and Flor, who are on the line for all of their work. This is one of the last times we'll be joining together with Valerie in this role 
and really I think we all need to recognize that she's made a crucial contribution and that this is just one of the latest tools which demonstrates uh, her commitment and which we hope really is going to mean that all of you in the field have uh, greater tools to draw on in going forward in this work. So once again, thank you so much colleagues. Looking forward to continue to work with you in this sphere. Wishing you all the very, very best and thank you all. Thank you so much colleagues, bye.